Okay, so Max, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, we've got a whole host of questions, but to start with, just give us a bit of an outline of what you're up to at the moment. Um, yeah, well, we've been back at Middlesex for the for the last few weeks. We um, managed to get some stuff in um, just for Christmas, uh, mainly drill-based work um, in at Lords, and then we had a bit of a break. Um, unfortunately, obviously, the, the COVID situation evolving, we had a, a, a little break at the start of January, but um, fortunately managed to get back into swing of things um, a couple of weeks ago, and We've been training in groups of um, four or five um, for the last few weeks and um, building into pre-season now. We're looking ahead to, to getting in the marquee at Merchant Taylor School on grass wickets um, on the 1st of March, which is exciting. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been in um, four days a week, I think, um, at Middlesex in small groups, um, just doing some technical work and looking ahead to the season. And then what does that sort of consist of? Is it facing bowlers or is it more just skills-based, you know, homing a certain skill? Uh, yeah, it's moved on to facing bowlers most of the time now. I think we tend to do most of our technical work and drill work before Christmas um, in indoor school and do a lot of our, our basics and our, our technique stuff against machines and, and we throw downs before Christmas and then we try and prioritise and have as much time as we can facing the, the bowlers um, in, uh, in, in practice as much as we can. I've got um, Tim Murta and James Harris in my group, so two, two excellent bowlers to face um, in my group of five and I like to try and face bowl as much as I can, really, because I think that's obviously the, the best way to replicate a game and do scenarios against bowlers and things like that. We've um, done a fair amount of that in, uh, in recent weeks. And then on top of that, I guess there's some, some fitness going on as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've, um, we've got a couple of S&Cs. So they split into, again, to separate groups for, for COVID reasons. And then we, um, yeah, we've been in pairs in the gym doing two or, th two or three gym sessions a week. And then we've actually had to do our... Our running stuff on our own so I had to get out and uh, motivate ourselves to do runs uh, individually rather than as a group which is obviously a shame but um, yeah trying to keep on top of our fitness as well because obviously it's a long summer ahead and important we um, as fit as we can to get through that. And then with regards to sort of the summer uh, that you touched on there how does your training look in comparison to what it would look like right now? Um, it's actually I think the one of the challenges I guess of the summer is because the county schedule is so packed, um, we actually have quite limited training time in between games. Obviously, you're travelling, you're moving on to the next game. So I think um, in the summer, it's really important to have uh, specific practice as much as you can and really know exactly when you want to get out in session because you might only have one session a week if you're playing four-day game, one-day game and travelling in between. So I think it's real a real focus needed in those summer, summer blocks to, on your training to know exactly what sort of gets you ready to play and it's more around preparation rather than, you know, now I might be doing some technical work and thinking about different technical things. But I think I try and park that as much as I can, can in the summer and just more focus on those games and use the training as um, preparation for the game. So if you're, you know, if you know, know you're coming up against, know if you're coming up against different type of bowlers, work on that in, uh, in practice leading up to, up to games to really um, narrow down what you need to work on. And then do you find it hard to like sort of going from different format to format? Yeah, yeah it's something I've, I've found... Yeah, quite tricky over the years, I guess. I think um, I've got a bit better at the last couple, but um, I think particularly in red ball cricket, um, I found it a challenge sort of coming back to red ball cricket after playing white ball. Um, obviously, you know, opening the batting, um, it's obviously a challenge with the red ball moving around. And I think I found it initially quite challenging, almost in the white ball mindset and then switching back to red ball. Um, I found it, maybe I was playing a few, few too many loose shots, big drives and things like that, which obviously are not as um, appropriate in the red ball game. Um, but I guess now we've done a, you know, a bit more of it and your, your practice is almost tailored to the different formats and you can try and change your game plan as much as you can. Um, but it is, a, yeah, it is a challenge. And then sort of, I'm not sure if you ever have actually done this, but batting in the middle order as opposed to the top of the order, how do you sort of change the way you approach that? Yeah, it is a challenge. Um, I think I did it um, a couple of years ago, certainly when I first got in the Middlesex team, especially in Red Bull cricket, I was... Um, batting in the middle order a bit more um, and I found it a challenge because sort of growing up I'd always opened and always been used to sort of going straight out to bat and not having to really think about it but um, I almost find it a bit more of a mental challenge almost waiting to bat and not being you no know, I tried to almost watch every ball and focus on every ball and I found you know by the time I went out to bat I was almost so mentally drained and, and fatigued from watching watching the game I, I found it hard to almost switch on um, so I think, you know, it's almost important to be able to relax, I guess, waiting to bat. And I, I found that um, a bit tricky having, having opened um, most of my career. And is that something that's equally as hard sort of when you're fielding, knowing that you're opening, when you're back into your fielding stint? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think especially um, as it gets towards the end of the day, you know, it's always a, a tricky time if you have, you know, 5, 10, 15 overs to bat at the end of the day, a long day fielding. And 
you know, suddenly the team team are right down. You start, you know, thinking about batting and thinking about, you know, when those wickets are going to fall. And um, I guess that's why it's important to have a, a bit of a routine you go through um, when that wicket falls to get your get yourself in the frame of mind to, to go out and bat. Because obviously you could have been fielding for a day and a half and then you've got to go out and switch on um, within 10 minutes. So have a little routine that I'd go through to try and um, get myself in the in the right frame of mind. Yeah, so, and what does that routine consist of, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, yeah, well, it's sort of like, um, I'd always pad up in a certain way, like put the right pads on the right first. I know it sounds silly, but it almost switches me onto batting mode from fielding fielding mode. Then I like to have a bit of time on my own before I go to bat. So I sort of try and pad up as quick as I can and almost go and try and sit away from the, the other guys in the, in the dressing room. Because obviously there's a lot going on, a lot of noise in the dressing room to sort of um distract you i guess so i try and pad up as quick as i can I almost go and sit on the balcony on my own and sort of gather my thoughts and um go through the plan i want to go through um when i get out into the middle um obviously i know who i'm going to be coming up against have a think about that and think exactly how i want to sort of negotiate the first um few hours really but i think that time to sort of be on my own um in a you know quiet place and sort of relax and, and can, you know really switch on to to the innings at hand is quite important to me because you know like I said everyone everyone here will know that sort of dressing room a lot can be going on a lot of chat about the innings a lot of chat what's gone on the wicket and various things like that and I almost find it quite um important to step away from that and sort of gather my thoughts and and really focus on, on what I need to do rather than what's gone and would you face any balls before going out to bat or is it simply you know just switching on by mentally preparing um yeah no it's more mental for me I think obviously there's not always as much time you know some guys if there's a wicket um falls at sort of lunch you can sort of go to the nets and, and hit a few balls but um for me personally it'd be more mental preparation I try and do you know all my all my batting practice in the morning of the day I've got a little routine I'd go through in the morning and um I sort of try and do that as much as I can so I know I've that's almost been banked and prepped um so then when I go out to bat it's almost that mental preparation is more important to me rather than sort of trying to rush and hit you know a few underarms or something um I don't I think that's sort of all the work you've done leading up to that's more important than sort of um, cramming something in in those you know five or ten minutes so it's more uh, more mental preparation for me I'd say. And then actually a question that's been raised uh, by Hannah who's actually our ladies captain um, how did you deal with sort of the pressures of captaining England in the 19s as well as performing at the same time as an individual player? Yeah it's a good question I found it um, found it very tricky to, to start with because I hadn't done a great deal of captaincy um, sort of growing up through the sort of the younger age groups it's almost thrown upon me when I hadn't really had um, that much experience and I found it um, quite mentally draining you know a lot of decisions to make in the field um, especially in the longer format over over long days I found it quite mentally um, fatiguing and obviously a lot goes with captaining and you know, you're, you're chatting to the bowlers you're chatting to people at the end of the day's play you're giving the team talk and um, a lot goes into that and you almost sometimes forget that you know your job in the team is to you know score runs take wickets um, and that's your your primary role so you have to find a way I guess of um, focusing when it's your time to, to bat or do your skill, really having a, a way of focusing on this is what I need to do um, to get the best at myself. And then when that's not the time, that's when you think about the team and other people. Um, so I guess it's about managing your time um, and almost having, I remember I listened to an interview with Andrew Strauss, he sort of said, as soon as he puts the helmet on, whether it be in practice or in a game, he's Andrew Strauss, the, the batsman. And when he takes it off, he's Andrew Strauss, the captain. And that's when he's worrying about all the other stuff that comes with captaincy. Um, but yeah, definitely initially, and it, it does take some practice, I guess, to to find a way of thinking, right, this is my time, I need to be in my zone, and I need to be focusing on what I need to doing. And then obviously the rest of the time, you're there to, to help the team and support the team the best you can. But um, I don't think it definitely probably gets easier the, the more I did it and the uh, more experience I got. And did you find sort of that element of pressure also impacting your game outside of England? So obviously there's probably quite a lot of talk around you being England captain or under 19 captain. Did you find that impacted you at Middlesex as well? Um, I think I had to be careful. Um, it didn't. I think one thing I've sort of always, I guess, tried to do is is not look too far ahead and almost focus on what's in, in front of you. I know it's a cliche, but I think that's, that's the most important thing to do. You know, um, I think if you start looking too far ahead and thinking about, you know, what people might be saying about you or good things or bad things people might be saying about you, I think that sort of distracts you from the, from the task at hand really and I think um, obviously yeah, it was a great honour to, to be able to captain you know the 19s and obviously there's um, some talk of things that come through that but uh, when I was at Middlesex I tried to just you know do my best I could for them and focus on on almost the next game really I think if you start thinking about oh this person said this or this person said that or how good it is I'm, I'm um, fortunate enough to captain England 19s and look too far ahead I think that's when um, things become a bit tricky I think maybe it bought 
maybe I put myself on a bit more pressure than I probably should have done at times. I think I thought, okay, I've got to, you know, score more runs, or I've got to do this, or I've got to do that to keep progressing. Um, so I think in hindsight, maybe, you know, find a way to take a little bit more pressure off myself um, I, would have been, uh, would have been beneficial. But um, yeah, like I said, I think what I've always tried to do um, growing up is, is not look too far ahead and obviously have a, have a dream and, a, and an aspiration of where you want to get to. But um, I think if you start thinking about things down the line or what people might be saying about you, that's when um, things become more tricky. And then on captaincy, we've actually had a question from someone in the chat. So uh, Luke Bishard has asked, who, who's the best captain you've played under and what made him a good captain? Uh, yeah, good question. I think obviously at Middlesex, we're very fortunate to have um, Owen Morgan um, around a fair amount of time when he's he's not obviously on England duty. And he, you know, when I first sort of got played a few T20s, he was the he was the captain. I think it's difficult to, to look past him, um, obviously, as a captain, I think. Um, I think the thing I'd say about um, Morgan is it almost like he's exactly how you think he'd be watching him on TV. He's so cool. He's so calm. Um, I think it's important for a captain not to sort of ride the waves of the emotion of the game. He stays sort of very level throughout. I think, you know, watching him or, or listening to him talk, you wouldn't really realise what the state of the game was, whether we're on top, whether the team are on top of us. He just seems to stay very level. Um, and I think that's why he's able to make such sort of um, great decisions under pressure because he's not too emotional he's able to think, you know, really clearly, even when the ball is going out of the park and, you know, it's easy to lose your rag. He stays very, very calm and very level and almost sticks to the plan. Um, even when, uh, even when things maybe aren't going, going as well. So I think yeah, I was very fortunate to, to play under him. Um, and I th think he's obviously, uh, he's probably you know, England's best ever captain. So I'd, uh, I'd definitely say him. Um, aside from that, so other than just captaincy, uh, if you're in a really tough period in a match, how do you sort of dig in um, and what do you find? Is there a certain something you do that really makes you switch on and focus? Yeah, no, it's tricky. Like I said, obviously, um, opening, I guess, a lot of the time is, you know, when you first go out to bat, if you, especially if you're batting first, that first little period can be the, um, you know, the hardest time to bat. So I think um, what I always try and tell myself is, you know, if I get in, you know, things are always going to generally get easier. If you get through a tough time or a tough spell, um, it, you know, the chances are later down the line, you're going to be um, rewarded from all that hard work. So I like to sort of keep reminding myself that, you know, knuckle in, um, do the hard work now and I'll um, be rewarded later. That's obviously a, a big thing that Stuart Law, our, our coach, speaks about quite a lot is in those first two sessions of a day's play almost sets up the, the third session where you can sort of cash in. And if you're, if you still have batters in at that point, the bowlers are tired, the ball's older um that's when you do your hard work um you know but even just simple things whether it be leaving well moving your feet um really quickly obviously is important i think um yeah that's the main thing i'd say is being able to um, assess conditions very early assess what shots are going to be appropriate on this pitch is it an, is it a green seamer where driving is going to be difficult i guess it's you know openers you don't always have a an idea what it's going to be like till you get out there but um being able to assess those conditions really quickly and what shots are going to be you know, your bankers on that day, I, I guess, is the main um, advice I'd give. And, you know, if it's a fast, bouncy pitch, you know, my main scoring options might be off the back foot. And, um, yeah, so I guess as soon as you go out there, in your mind, be thinking um, very quickly what, what shots are going to be um, the best to play on that pitch to, to get through the tricky spells, I'd say. And then alongside that, another question uh, from someone in the chat, Adam Delamere has asked, um, sort of batting in white ball cricket, how do you switch between sort of facing seam from one end and there could be a spinner on the other end? So two completely different uh, bowlers. Yeah, no, another good question. That's obviously um, tricky. And I think teams seem to do that more and more um, in counter cricket, try and mix up the bowlers so you don't sort of get set against uh, a particular type of bowling bowler. Um, I think what we do quite well um, generally is we sort of analyse the opposition before the game. So you might think, OK, this is a spinner we're going to come up against. This is their seam attack. And then almost before the game, you can come up with a game plan um, uh, against a particular type of bowler. So it might be their spinners, their main threat, and we want to hit him for six and over in a T20 and make sure we don't lose any wickets and we can target um, another bowler. Um, so I guess if you don't know who you're playing against, what I would say is almost being so clear on your on your game plan to spin and seam would be the most important thing. Um, I think obviously spin um, particularly can be you know difficult and you can get bogged down in in white ball cricket. Um, so if you're crystal clear on that game plan, again, going into the game that, you know, if an off spin is bowling at you, this is my boundary option. This is where I'm going to look to rotate the strike. And if you have that in your mind, um, almost before you go out to bat and obviously be prepared to adapt, but if you have that in your mind, that game plan, 
um, I think that probably puts you in the best place to sort of um, not feel that pressure because you know exactly how you're going to go about this and uh, how you're going to try and score off him. And then as a left-handed batter, do you prefer it when someone comes over around the wicket and you prefer not to give away your sort of trade secrets? Could you let us know some advantage or disadvantage to, to both? Uh, that was actually a question from Louis Day, that one. Yeah, I've um, yeah, it's a very good question. I've actually had a few struggles from um, from around the wicket um, in the last couple of years, and I've I've always found um, obviously played a you know a few years now, and I played against the, um, the same bowlers over a few years, and obviously they do the analysis as new the same way you would do on them, and I think um, bowlers have worked out that I'm a bit more vulnerable to the ball um, around the wicket, almost moving away from from the bat from around the wicket, which is obviously a tricky angle to face as a left hander. Um, and I found that, you know, more and more bowlers are doing that to me um, almost from ball one. So obviously it's my job to try and adapt and find a way of um, almost negating that. Um, I've done little, little sort of things like I moved a bit further um, across my crease to try and line the ball up with a bit of a straighter bat um, from around the wicket. Um, and obviously from over the wicket, I find um, the best thing to do is to try and leave as well as you can, especially Red Bull cricket, because the natural angle of the ball from over, obviously going across across the, um, the left hand, if you leave as well, that makes the bowler, uh, bowl to you and in you know on your pads and things like that which is where obviously you, you want them to be in um in red ball cricket but um little things around my guard and my my lineup would be the main thing i think about i'd be a bit more open when the, when the bowler's over the wicket and slightly more closed um when they're around just to make sure i line the ball up um from the angle it's coming from the, the best i can i'd say right okay um if i sort of open it up now to guys who are on the chat some people have sent me a question um so one of them is uh, it's actually uh, one of Lee Forshaw's boys. Um, Lee, if you want to unmute, and if one of the boys wants to ask their question. If you could choose anyone, who would you be, be your ideal opening batting partner and why? Uh, very good question. Um, I'd probably say Alistair Cook. I think um, growing up, he was a, he was a hero of mine. Um, and I was, I was lucky enough to play against him last year. And I think even now, obviously a bit older than he used to be. Um, he's still such a great county player and obviously an absolute England legend now. I think um, the main thing I'd say about him when I obviously spoke about game plan a little bit earlier, I'd say he was obviously probably not the most naturally talented um, England player, um, but how hard he worked and how driven he was to, to succeed, obviously was the thing that obviously stands out about him. And, you know, he didn't have all the shots, but he knew exactly where to score to different type of bowlers and, um, I think to score the number of runs he did in, in test cricket as an opening batsman in, um, in England is will probably, you know, very unlikely to ever happen again. So I think he was uh, he was sort of the guy I looked up to when I was was growing up. And um, I'd probably say he'd be my my ideal opening partner. Um, he's obviously Essex, so I'm not sure I'll ever get the chance to open with him. But um, yeah, he'd be um, he'd be up there as my uh, you know, ideal partner, I'd say. And another question that's actually come in uh, from Peter Birch is, uh, have you ever had to change your technique at all? And if so, how did you go about changing it? Yeah, I have. I've yeah, um, I've made you know, sort of subtle changes my my whole career, I guess. Really, um, I think one thing I'd say about uh, technical changes, I think I, I think they're tricky to do um, massive changes in season um, because obviously you're playing so many games and your focus should be on you know almost game plan how you're going to score as many runs as you can in those games. I think it's, you can make sort of little changes and little tweaks in the season to to make small improvements but if I was going to make you know a relatively large change I'd try and do that in the winter months when um, we're not playing as much because you know you've got time then to away from the pressure of you know games and you know pressure of scoring runs to really sort of get to grips with a, a new technique or a new um, way of playing and you can almost groove that through the months of the winter so it's ready to go um, in the season um, sort of the main main change I would have done um, would have been a couple of years ago. I had a quite a tricky year in in 2019, and it didn't go as well as I'd like. And I had quite um, quite a few struggles over that season. So, sort of that winter, I sat down with the coaching staff and, and sat down with the, the middle sector cabin director, actually, who who sort of knows my game best because I obviously um, I spent time with him since I was 11 years old. So we we sort of sat down and thought, you know, what 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 sort of went wrong um, in the summer and things I could do. And I made little changes to my back lift and little changes to my slight trigger movement um, and sort of, yeah, had the winter at home to, to really practice them as and grew down as much as I can and sort of managed to implement them um, more last year. Um, so I think, yeah, that's advice. I do, you know, do as much, much technical work, technical work as way from, way from cricket and away from the games as you can, um, whether that's, you know, drills or bowling machine work. Um, I think that's the best way of doing it rather than 
sort of being under pressure against bowlers and things like that because it's almost your main focus when you're facing the bowlers watching the ball and and, uh, and playing him the best you can. So I did most of my technical work in the winter against drills, underarms, uh, bowling machine work, and things like that. And, and then another question that's come in, um, what is your favorite attacking shot and why? Favorite attacking shot and why? Um, it's probably not my not my best shot. Uh, I don't play it that often, but uh, I think a straight drive against a, a good quick bowler would be um, would be my my favorite shot. Cause I think to hit, uh, hit a good bowler for a you know perfect straight drive is you know probably shows that all the test technical aspects of your batting's in a good place. I think if you can if you can keep balanced and hit the bat the ball back where it came comes from, um, probably shows that all the things that make a, a batter click and you know you know head position, you know body weight, weight into the ball, footwork, um, bat path is all in a all in sync and in a good place. So I'd probably say that's the the nicest shot to play. I think you know probably my my best shot is probably a pull shot or something like that, but. Um, I think uh, yeah, straight drive would be uh, be my favourite shot. I think. Okay, if we jump across to the Robinsons, if you want to unmute and ask you one of your questions, have you got any tips on facing swing bowling? Uh, very good question. Um, swing bowling, yeah, I think the, the tricky thing about swing, obviously, is um, that you know the later it swings, is the the harder it is, I guess, really. Some bowlers get to swing it from the hand and you can you can almost read the swing quite early. But when it swings late, I think that's the the trickier um, type of bowler to face. And I think the yeah the main, the main main advice I guess I'd give or what I try and do is um, move as late as you can because then if you move late, you get a you know idea of where the line's going to be. I think people get into into problems get swing bowling when you almost overcommit too early. And that means, you know, you close yourself off with your foot or you can't get access to the ball. So I think it's important to, when you're facing a good swing bowler, just to wait that split second longer to sort of track the line of the ball and then move late and fast um, into line would be my my um, main advice. Because I think if you overcommit too early, that's when you get into into problems and you play it one you shouldn't do or it gets you on the pad because you close yourself off. So um, move as late and, and as fast as you can would be, um, be the main thing I'd say. And do you have another one, Ed or Molly? Um, I'm... A spin bowler, and I was just wondering, what's like the hardest length to play off? Is it on your toes or bouncing? Good, yeah. Well, you know, I try and bowl spin, but I'm probably not as good as you. I'm not a very good, um, good off spinner. But um, the best spinners I face, um, I think they bowl, they bowl the ball into the pitch, a little bit shorter. Um, I think the if the, if you sort of float it up a bit too much, and it's quite you know a bit too full. Um, that can be easier to play because you almost can cover the spin. I think the best. The best sort of spinners I come up against would bowl the ball, you know, quite quick, you know, into that length where it's hard to know whether to go forward or back to it. So it's sort of that that in between length um, where it's not easy to to rock onto the bat for it, but you can't quite get to the pitch and smother it. I think if you go a little bit too full, that's when you can sort of read it and get get to the pitch and almost negate the spin. And obviously, if you're too short, then you've got time to to rock back and and play a pull shot or a cut shot. So people bowl the ball quite quickly into that in between length and gets people. Um, caught in the crease. I don't know if anyone watched the, the England Test match, but all those wickets that Ashwin got was when when the batsmen were sort of caught in two minds, not knowing whether to go forward or back, and that's when they got the the catches at short leg and the catches at slip. So um, I guess that that in between length, if it makes sense, uh, would be the the toughest for me to play. I think. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. Okay, if we jump across to Barnabas Smith, he's got quite a few questions, I think. So fire one away, yeah. Barnabas. Um. How hard did you have to work uh, to become a professional England cricketer? Oh, um, yeah, good question. I think I had to work very hard. I think I think um, I probably wasn't the most, I guess, naturally uh, gifted player um, when I was younger. And um, but I think ever since I was, you know, maybe ten or eleven, I had the dream of of becoming a professional cricketer, and that was my my goal. And what I realised quite early what I wanted to do, um, and I sort of made quite a lot of sacrifices and. And worked as hard as I could to, to make that happen, really. Um, so I think it's very, very important to, to work as hard as you can, you know, on your on your skill work, on your fitness, um, and all areas of your game. I think, you know, there's no sort of substitute to that hard work. And I think generally, if you work hard, the, the rewards will come. Um, and I think, yeah, that that sort of goal I had when I was young and the dream I had of um, of playing for Middlesex and uh, making it as professional cricket sort of spurred me on um, to, to try and work as hard, as hard as anyone. And and sort of push the boundaries and, and be as good as I could be really but um, I think it's important to still enjoy it as well because you know it's, it's not always you know easy and there's going to be bumps along the road so it's important to keep that perspective and 
realise you're, you know, very lucky to, you know, be playing cricket and enjoying it and uh, sort of don't, you know, ride the roller coaster too much and get too too down when things don't go as well. And, you know, also you know, when, you, when you do well, don't get too high as well. So try and stay as, as level as you can throughout because, you know, if you're a batsman, you, you know, you're probably going to fail more times than you succeed. So if you get too down yourself, that can... Uh, that could be detrimental, but yeah, I had to, I had to work as hard as I could and, and, and yeah, still have to work hard now to try and uh, try and get better. So um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, working hard is uh, no substitute to that. And uh, yeah, I had to work pretty hard, I think. Um, what do you do outside of cricket to try and stay fit? Um, well, I try, we obviously do our, our gym work. Um, we do um, do some weights and work in the gym with the, the middle sets coaches. I actually do quite enjoy going on runs on my own as well. I go um, try and, especially in lockdown, there was lots of time to, to try and make myself as fit as I could and go out on lots of runs and uh, try and, you know, it's, in London, it's not always easy because there's, you know, so many cars and it's so busy, but try and find some nice places to, to run around and keep as fit as I can. Um, I actually play quite a bit, lot of, um, a lot of golf as well. I know it's not the, probably the best fitness but being out and about for you know three four hours on your feet is probably quite good for you know time after spending the field so I play quite a lot of golf as well. Cheers. Um, what is your favourite type of bowler to face and why? Oh I find them all quite difficult uh, to be honest with you. Um, favourite type of bowler to face I actually sometimes prefer people who who swing the ball rather than those horrible type of bowlers who sort of pitch up and try and seam it because I find it harder to almost line them up because it moves so late off the, off the seam. Um, and I, I find I have more trouble against them. Whereas swing bowlers, I think if I watch the ball really hard, um, I can sort of try and find a way of, um, of negotiating them. So I think the difficult question to say who I um, like facing the most, but I think the least, the, my least favourite bowler would be those, would be um, guys who hit the seam and, and nip it around. Cheers. And... Uh, what are the best three bits of advice you would give to an 11 year old who wants to play cricket for England? Oh, tough one. Um, first one would be, would definitely be work hard. I know we obviously touched that on, on your, um, touched on that before, but I think, um, like I said, I think if you, if you do work hard and do have that aspiration of, of going on and, and, and being the best you can, I think you have to, have to put in the work and have to put in the groundwork to, to try and make that happen. Um, second bit of advice I'd give, um, I think, you know, looking back on, on me, which all I could speak about when I was young, I, I, I put myself under an awful lot of pressure, like I said, to, um, <clears throat> to do well and, and score runs. And I think in hindsight, I probably would have enjoyed the, the journey a bit more than, than I could have, than, than, I, um, than I did perhaps. And obviously I've had great times and great memories, but I think, like I said before, I, um, I put myself under a lot of pressure to score runs. And I think um, I now realise, um, now I'm a bit older, that cricket's tough and uh you know it's not always going to be straightforward and easy or an easy road and I think to try and stay a level as you can and keep in mind where you want to get to and not get too down when when things don't go, go to plan would be um be my second one um and then the third bit of advice I'd say know know your strengths I think you know you now will be will have something that you know you do better than other people and I think keep that in mind because that's what's gonna drive you forward to get better um you know, whether you're exiting against a short ball, whether you can, you know, you can spin the ball more than anyone else, where it might be, always remember what your strengths are because that's what's going to sort of get you through, you know, a tough period against a tough bowler or, you know, bowling against a tough batsman. Remember not what they can do or, or what you're weak at. Remember what your, you know, your super strength is because that's what's going to, you know, set you apart from other people. You know, for me, it probably was, you know, I, I loved batting and I, could you know try try to make myself as difficult as I could to get out and make sure I didn't throw my wicket away because I just you know I love batting and I love practicing so much that I didn't want to um, give it up easily so I tried to make myself as hard as I could to get out you know it could be you bowl fast or it could be your you know whatever it is remember your strength because that's what you know you're going to rely on when you when you get under a bit of pressure um, so yeah I'd say that those three would be the the three bits of advice I'd give thank you no problem mate Okay, if we jump across to Jasper Doherty, I think he's got a few questions. So if you want to unmute yourself, Jasper. How many hours uh, training do you do per day? I think you might be muted, actually, Max. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, good question. Um, it does, um, it varies a bit. I think if you, 
I actually, when I was when I was younger, I think I used to practice um, more than I do now. I think when I now I've got a little bit older, um, I'm a bit more aware of exactly what I need to do and what I need to get out of my practice. So I sort of try and spend a little bit less time, but maybe a bit more focus on um, on what I'm doing. Generally, sort of middle sex sessions. So today I was in for for two and a half hours um, <clears throat> in a group of five. So that'd be about a, an average time session. But I think when I was young, I used to just want to bat and bat and bat. Um, and sort of didn't you know you had to sort of kick me out the nets really I'm sure there's you know a few guys like that here um, on the call um, but uh, yeah when I was young I used to you know probably bat a bit longer than I do now um, but as I got older I probably realized that sometimes the best thing to do because is to you know have relax and and sort of work really hard when you're there and then have other times where you sort of switch off as well but um, I'd say about two and a half hours three hours would be a an average um, time that the middle set of guys would be in in training in a day Um, what would you say is the most defining moment in your career? Ooh, most defining moment. Um, that's a very, very tricky one. Um, most defining moment. I think my, I think my first first class hundred was a, a big moment for me. I actually went on loan to, to Northamptonshire um, when I was nineteen. And I saw at that point I, um, I played for the nineteens, <clears throat> England nineteens, and then played a. A fair amount of second team um, cricket, but I think um, obviously the dream is always to play first class cricket and make that step up. And I guess when you when you're there, you think, oh, am I going to be good enough? You know, am I going to get found out? Um, am I not going to be able to make that step up? So I think that first uh, hundred I scored sort of gave me a, a bit a lot of confidence to think, you know, what I can do this at this level. And I think until you have that sort of innings or moment or uh, bowling spell where it sort of all goes all goes well, it's sometimes hard to find that. Uh, in a belief that you belong there so I think that was quite a, a big moment in my career um, obviously you know uh, captaining 19s captaining the 19s was a incredible honour and something I'm very very proud of and uh, that's probably the proudest proudest moment of my career would be um, captaining them but I think that first first class 100 was a uh, was a great moment because it sort of made me think you know I can I can do it against these sort of guys and I can um, I sort of uh, you know can uh, perform at this level so that was the that was a big moment. Um, who is your favourite cricketer to watch? Oh, um, favourite cricketers to watch. Um, I'd probably say AB de Villiers. I've always I've loved watching. Um, he he played for Middlesex actually a couple of years ago, and I think the way he, you know he can play every shot in the book. Um, he's such an entertainer and, and a great player to watch. You know we were. We're lucky to watch a few of his amazing innings at Middlesex, um, obviously from close hand. And uh, I think the fact he can do it in all three formats, I think he's scored one of the slowest test match 50s ever and the fastest um, ODI 100. So that's pretty good, uh, pretty good pedigree to show you can do it uh, um, in sort of all scenarios. And I think the way he can you know, sort of take down a bowling attack at, at Will really is great to watch. And uh, yeah, he was sort of a yeah, great guy to watch growing up. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, if we go across to Harry Bisson, if you want to ask your question. What do you think is the optimum mentality to go out to bat with? Optimum mentality? Um, I think, yeah, it's actually what my, uh, my dad he always used to say to me when I was young, and uh, he'll probably be pleased that I still remember it, um, is he used, to, he used to say, be relaxed but focused. Um, and I think that's quite a good um, good mantra to, um, to live by, I think. Um, obviously you've got to be so switched on you've got to be in the zone if you like and uh, have a way where you can really really concentrate on the ball and watch the ball as hard as you can but also I think it's important to have a way of sort of almost in between balls uh, being able to switch off and relax because if you want to bat for you know a long period of time if you're sort of so switched on the whole time um, it can be difficult and you sort of can lose concentration um, so I'd say that's uh, sort of something I'd like to tell myself um, before I go out to bat um, but you definitely need, you know, you watch the best players. You watch Steve Smith, you watch Virat Kohli. It's almost, almost have that steely focus when the when the ball's coming down. It seems like there's nothing else in their mind, no distractions. When uh, the bowler turns it in his mark, he, they're, you know, so focused on that ball. And that's the only thing that, that matters at that moment. And then in between balls, that's when they switch off and um, uh, unwind and, and sort of then go on to the next ball. So I think, um, yeah, having that way of focusing, um, but then relaxing between balls would be the, be the best mentality to have but I think it's um, definitely something tricky and 
you know on different days you can you can feel you know, some days you can feel really good and it's easy to focus other days um, it can be more tricky. So, uh, you know, having a way of getting in that mindset uh, as much as you can is um, it's not easy, but I think the best players can do that. Thank you. Okay, and going back to uh, Freddie Forshaw, if you want to ask your other question. If you could play in any franchise team in the world, who would it be and why? Any franchise team? I'd like, anyone, anyone who would take me would uh, be good. But... Um, I do love watching the um, watching the Big Bash. I think that's a great tournament. I think the the wickets are brilliant there. They they produce you know good cricket on those pitches. And um, yeah, I know a few guys have gone over there and played and, and done well. And I think that's a great great competition. Um, I was in uh, in Perth a few years ago playing playing some great cricket. So I watched quite a lot of the Big Bash um, over in Perth. And I thought it was a, a yeah brilliant competition. I like watching it in the in the mornings over here. Um, so I'd probably be uh, be number one, but um, yeah, that would be uh, yeah, I'd like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've had a message in the chat as well. So from Evan Lahore, right? uh, who's the hardest bowler you've faced and why? Um, I faced uh, I faced James Anderson a, a couple of years ago when he was playing for playing for Lancashire, and I think he he obviously is you know probably well undoubtedly being his best ever, and um, I found it very very tricky to play bowled at bowl at Lord so with the slope it was even more difficult to sort of line him up and um yeah he was swinging out I think he had the he had the better than me he got me out both innings I think unfortunately um but yeah it was great great experience to face him because obviously he's another guy I'd watched um watched growing up and um yeah it's a bit surreal seeing him uh, him running in against me but um I think he uh yeah he'd be the the trickiest I'd face I'd say um trying to think uh trying to think who else Nathan Lyon I found I found very hard because he um, obviously a left-hander. Um, him spinning the ball away from the bat was was pretty tricky um, to try and defend against him. But uh, I'd say those two would be the be the standouts. Okay, is there any more questions from the floor at all? If someone wants to put their hands up, if anyone's got any more. Whilst we're waiting for any more to come in, uh, what sort of things do you do outside of cricket to switch off, Max? Um, yeah, I think that's a very important point. I think. You know, like I said, cricket can almost be all, all encompassing at times and you can, you know, be thinking about it so much. I think it's very important to have um, something away from cricket. Um, and obviously it's different for different people to switch off and unwind and almost get away from the, the stresses and um, of playing cricket every day. So, you know, I play, like I said, play a lot of golf. I try and spend as much time with um, friends away from cricket um, where you don't, you know, don't have to speak about cricket too much or think about it too much. and You can almost relax and unwind. Um, I'm also doing online um, university degree, which a, f a few, quite a few of the Middlesex team are doing. Yeah, um, obviously, you could do it all online, and we've got a deal with the with the university where we can do it over um, a certain number of years. Um, so I'm doing that in sports business management. Um, so yeah, I try and do a few different things to sort of unwind and, and forget about cricket in, in my spare time. And then one from Hannah: uh, If you've had to deal with any setbacks, what have you done to get yourself back on track and back in line? Yeah, um, good question, Anna. Yeah, I've, um, yeah, obviously, like uh, like any player, you'd have times where where things qu don't quite go to plan, and, and you have setbacks. And I think the way I've always tried to sort of go through it is by almost resetting and then working harder and and going again. Really, I think it's not always easy. If things are you know sort of spiral out of control, and you end up you know you know over you know five six weeks don't do as well as you like, and you, you know it's easy to get down and. Um, cross with yourself and you know frustrated because you think you know I'm doing all this and you know why is it not quite going going to plan really um, so almost having that time you know step away for a couple of days think about what you're doing think about what you do when you're at your best because um, it's probably something a little simple thing that you're not quite doing uh, whether it's technical mental I don't know what it might be but it's probably a very simple thing that you're not doing that you do normally when you're you know playing at your at your best level so take that time step away and think right okay it's a small technical thing that I'm not um not doing that I do when I'm, I'm playing really well um, and then okay I'm going to work as hard as I can um, on that in the nets to, to sort of push on and, and go again but um, yeah I think the, the thing to remember I guess is all the all the great players have had times where things don't quite go to plan and it's not the you know not the end of the world it doesn't mean you're a bad cricketer um, it just means you're going for a little period where things aren't um, quite clicking for you and keep that belief that you know things will turn around if you um, if you keep working hard. And I think we've got one from Harry Newton, if Harry wants to unmute himself. Yeah, um, 
is there any pressure, uh, extra pressure playing at Lords? Extra pressure playing at Lords. Um, I think initially there probably was because it was such a yeah, like a bit like I said about facing Jimmy. It was quite surreal walking out of Lords, walking through the long room. Um, and obviously it's what everyone, you know, dreams of doing. So I think initially it was almost like, I can't believe I'm here. How amazing um, is this? But I think the more I played there, I've almost, that sort of has passed. And it's just the, you know, the appreciation of what a, you know, amazing ground it is and how lucky we are as Middlesex to play there, you know, every other game. And it's, you know, it's a great, you know, honour every time, sort of walk out to bat there. And, um, you know, it's actually quite tricky sometimes as a, as a batter with the slope because it's quite exaggerated and it can be hard, make things a bit harder to, to line up. So that gets a bit of a uh, bit of getting used to. But I think I wouldn't say added pressure. I think it's almost such a, a privilege to, to be there and realise so many great players have played there before you. Um, and, you know, even in the field, you know, looking around the ground, it's uh, it sort of doesn't really get old, the, you know, the, the feeling of, of playing there or, or being there because it's such a such an amazing place. So I wouldn't say pressure. I think it almost you know brings more enjoyment and uh, excitement to the game, especially, you know, um, if it's T20 with a, a packed crowd there, full house and the atmosphere is amazing. It's, um, yeah, it's just you need to try and soak it up as much as you can, really. So I wouldn't say pressure. I'd say um, more enjoyment um, it brings. Um, adding on to that crowd, crowd part, do you prefer playing without a crowd after lockdown or probably prefer with a crowd? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I think if you watch, if you watch some sports, um, you know, especially football and things like that. I think it's almost been a bit of a different game, um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, without a crowd. Um, and sort of some guys have found it easier, some guys have found it harder. I think, um, I think I personally, it's almost, you know, it's amazing playing in front of um, a huge crowd and it always brings you know, all that excitement and uh, the razzmatazz of a T20 and it's a great experience um, playing in front of it. Um, but I wouldn't say it massively affects me, you know, or hinders me in, in, you know, either way, you know, it's not really that beneficial or it's not, doesn't hinder me it sort of doesn't make too much difference I think when you're batting you almost focus so much on on the ball you actually almost forget the crowd are there um so I wouldn't say it's impacted me you know a great deal um because uh, like I said if it, you know if you spend too much time thinking about how many people are in the ground it's hard to sort of concentrate on the ball so um I wouldn't say it's sort of impacted me either way too much thanks and then Barnabas Smith's got another question if Barnabas wants to ask his uh yeah uh what do you think the India v England Test Series result would be? I think he wants a bet on it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd like to, I'd like to say um, it'll be three one England, but um, we will have to wait and see. I think um, I think India is a very very tough place to go for for an English team. I think I've, I've been there uh, once with the, the under 19s and then once with the England Lions, and I think India in their conditions are a very very difficult team to beat because conditions for an English player is, is so alien to them, you know, the amount of spin that's bowled, um, the way the wickets play, the way the Indian players bat, slightly different to, to English players. So I think if the wicket is similar to how it was in the last Test match, I think England will find it quite difficult and have to, I think actually the toss makes a massive difference to, to games over there and uh, it's such an advantage to be bat first and get runs on the board and almost have that scoreboard pressure which India had in the last Test um, England had in the first. So I think it'd be, I think it'd be quite close, but I think India in their conditions are very, very difficult to beat. And uh, I think, you know, England won there maybe six, six, seven years ago now with what, you know, when they had the, you know, it's almost a great England team with, you know, Cook, Peterson, Swan, um, Anderson in, in their prime. And it was such a amazing um, victory. And I think India in, in their conditions are, are very, very tough to beat. So I think um, India will be favourites, but I think if England, if England win the toss and bat, it'd be a big advantage and that, that um, brings them into the game. So I think it'll be uh, Sat on the fence a bit there, um, but I'd like to say I'd like to say England will win, but I think um, I think India will be favourites. Thank you. Okay, if we go back to the Robinsons, got another question. Um, when you're the captain and you've had like a long day in the field and the team's not doing as well as you hoped, how do you motivate them to keep going? How do I motivate them to keep going? Well, I think. Firstly, I say I think the worst thing you could do is almost get cross with people and you know shout at them and have a go at them because you know everyone's out there trying their best fighting hard for the team so I think um you know I've played under you know some captains or, or people that get quite angry and emotional when when things don't quite go to plan um but what I try and do is almost there's no point that evening necessarily discussing the game because people have had a had a long day's play and people are tired and people are already down about how the game's gone so I'd almost 
I think, you know, the best coaches and, and captains would let people go off, go home, um, relax in the evening and almost have the team talk the next morning for the next day's play and think, right, this is what's been and gone. You know, don't think about that now because we can't change that. How are we going to, you know, get things right in the next session and the next period of play? Because, you know, what's happened before, be it in a you know, one day game or, or a four day game, if you're having a team talk, what's happened has happened and you're, you can't change that. So there's no point dwelling on it too much. The only thing you do is look forward and, you know, the time for analysis, the time for deeply reviewing the game and what you've done, you know, and what comes, you know, in the days after the game when you've got time to reflect on it. Um, so I think the best captains would always be looking ahead rather than back. Um, so even if you had a tough day and, you know, if you've been bowled out for 100 and the team are 200 for four at the end of the play, there's no point really, you know, having to go at people or thinking we should have done this, we should have done that because that's not really going to going to change anything. The only thing you can have an impact on is uh, is the next um, next period of play, the next delivery. And, you know, it's the same if you're, even if you're not a captain and you're, you're a batsman, you know, if you've played a few bad shots, but you're still in, there's no point thinking about what happened two balls ago or I got dropped then or I'm not batting very well. The only thing you can think about or control is, is, what, is what happened next. Or if you're bowling and the first three balls of the over have gone for four and you're, you, you know, you've gone for 12 or three, the easy thing to do is think, oh, I'm, I'm bowling I'm going really badly here. The batsman's on top, this and that. But the only thing that matters is the next delivery because you can't change what's what's happened. So I think that mindset of always looking at the next ball and focusing on the next ball would be what um, the best captains and the best players would uh, would do. Thank you. OK, if we go across to Philippa as a question. She... Sorry. Um, yeah. Is there, um, Max, is there any interaction, any training, joint training sessions ever done with the women's side or any sort of masterclasses ever done between the, the two, the men's and the women's squads? Yeah, we do. We do a, a fair bit. Some of the fitness sessions in particular over lockdown, um, they're obviously done on Zoom. Um, we joined in and we did a lot of stuff together um, with the SNC coach running sessions for, for both men's and women's teams. Obviously, the, the Sunrisers um, who play... I've just uh, sort of been formed from from a Middlesex, Essex, and Kent. I think have, have formed one team called the Sunrisers, and now they're um, they've made quite a few professionals in their team, which is obviously a great step for for women's cricket, having a professional England's team, and also some professionals um, in England outside the outside the main uh, England women's team as well. So that's obviously a great great step forward for women's cricket, and hopefully that keeps going and that interaction um, continues. But we've done, yeah, met not much. Um, actual cricket work or, or sessions together they they you know we sort of trained um, a bit apart um, obviously mainly due to obviously COVID reasons as well but we've done you know quite a few um, online fitness sessions but I think that's the main thing from sort of Middlesex perspective how um, I think Middlesex have now got you know three or four um, professional women's players which obviously you know wasn't there um, three or four years ago so that's a great step um, in terms of driving that that forward and yeah hopefully that goes from goes from strength to strength but um Certainly, growing up in the Middlesex Academy, I trained with um, quite a few of the, the Middlesex women players who are now still playing, um, you know, for Middlesex now. So that's um, the good that sort of everyone's come through to together and um, and playing. So that's that's great. Thank you. Okay, and I think the final one is uh, from Matt Brebbin. He wants to know what's the best sledge you've heard. Probably best to keep it clean, I guess. <laughs> best best sledge I actually. You know, I actually haven't been sledged uh, a great deal in in county cricket. I try and keep um, keep a low profile as much as I can in the field because uh, I think if you start if you start saying too much, it sort of comes back comes back to haunt you when you um, in, when you uh, when you go out to bat. So I actually haven't you know I don't want to say uh, say too much. Maybe what's said to other people, but um, I actually quite fortunate not to be um, to be sledged too much. But um, I think even if someone says something to me, I try and be almost block it out like I said earlier and I think if you uh, you don't really want to worry what the bowler is saying to you, you can and uh, you know because they're only trying to do it to sort of distract you or, or get in your bubble really so I try and uh, sort of add the blinkers on and not literally listen to too much what's um, what's going on around me when I'm batting but um, so many people are saying stuff to me but I'm almost uh, so engrossed in my batting that I don't really hear what um, hear what they say but uh, yeah a few of the more more chirpier members of the Middlesex team probably cop a bit more bit more abuse than uh, than I do I try and uh, yeah like I said keep a keep a low profile because I think the bowlers um unfortunately always going to win really if you start um having to go back or anything like that he's probably going to be the one who has the last laugh at some point whether whether on 100 when he gets you out or or not it's probably um him who has the last laugh so I try and uh, yeah try and keep as quiet as I can 
like good stuff and thanks very much for coming on and you know answering any questions that everyone had um but I think no worries no worries at all perfect no thanks perfect. guys cheers thank you very much all the best all the best everyone